Hello again, everyone. It's Todd Starooch, the horror nerd here at New Jersey Horror Con and Film Festival at the Showboat in Atlantic City, New Jersey. It's Friday night, the first night of the convention. We're having a blast here talking to all the horror stars and icons that are here. And I have the pleasure of sitting here from uh, Nightmare on Elm Street 5, Jurassic Park, uh, Clone Wars, Mr. Whit Hertford. Whit, how are you? Good, how are you? Good. I am doing great. <laughs> it is, uh, I'm just a fan at heart. Yeah. So it is so much fun to get to meet and talk to all the people that I've loved watching in movies all these years. So well, we are, this is so cool. It's fun to come here. We. It's a really good time. Yeah. Yeah, you enjoy coming out to the conventions? Of course, yeah. Cool. Um, so I so I have to ask this, right? You're you're in Jurassic Park for what a minute, uh -huh. right? Yeah. And yet, <laughs> it's such a memorable yeah. interaction, such yeah. a memorable character. Uh, how much fun was it to film that scene with Sam Neill? It was really fun. <laughs> um, I mean, I the books had come out, so everybody knew the the hype about it, um, and of course, it's Spielberg, so. You know Spielberg, and uh, uh, and he just was so normal, but everything felt like a very magical moment. Mm. Uh, it was like 125 degrees in the Mojave Desert, um, but he he treated me like a real actor. He had me improvise some stuff that never made it to the final cut, mm -hmm. that uh, lives somewhere in some vault, I'm sure, mm -hmm. and. Yeah, it was it was a it was a great time. That's cool. I mean, look, you you you, you seem like a really nice guy, but in the movie, yeah. I'm like, I, that kid's kind of a jerk. Like, I'm glad he had it coming. <laughs> like, <laughs> that's the thing is, like, a lot of times when people say like, oh, I hated you, <laughs> and for a while, I like, I uh, I took that like personally. <laughs> oh wow, I'd like, yeah. I'd be like, wow, that's that's kind of rough. Because when you're a kid, you don't see the value of being like. A villainous character, mm. you know what I mean. You're not going like, "Ooh, that feels like Richard the Third or whatever," right? Like, you don't get that. But now I get the value of it, mm. and now I get when people say, "Oh, I, I can I curse?" By the way. Oh, absolutely. Uh, yeah. yeah. When I fucking hated your guts, <laughs> uh, that I'm like, dope. I, I did my job. Right. You know. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, that, and those are the best. Like the fact that you made you're just a kid, but you made people hate you. Yeah. It's a testament to the performance, you know? <laughs> yeah, I, I think it's just I had fun, you know? Yeah. Spielberg made it like, uh, not like it was a huge movie, that it was just, you know, a, a story we were telling. I think because it's not at the park, it mm. sits aside as like kind of an interesting part of that movie. Right. So, yeah. Cool. And well, the last thing I'll say is the, the look on your face at the very end yeah. after Sam Neill gives, you know, yeah. says what he says is, is priceless, makes the whole it's thing. It's just my freaky <laughs> eyes, man. And I think that's half of the reason why now at 40 fucking three years old, people are going like, oh, you look the same. And I'm like, I mean, no, I have, I have gray hair. I'm losing some of it. Uh, but the eyeballs are still freaky as hell, you know? It, I, you know, I wouldn't put it that way, but it, it, nice it's, still, you're still, it's still very recognizable. Thank you, you know, thank you. when I saw your photo, you know, that you were going to be here, yeah. I'm like, oh, yeah, that is that kid. Like, yeah, you're like, oh, wow, he's still not using moisturizer. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. <laughs> so, um, so I'm always very curious. Let me uh, show a photo here from your animation Please, let's work. talk about it. I am always very fascinated by voiceover work. What yeah. are some of the real, uh, the unique challenges to doing voiceover as opposed to being on screen? It's a great question. Actor? So the thing that I think really has to make sense <clears throat> for voiceover to work, especially animation, is that you have to have such a wild imagination um, to, to figure out what you can't see. Mm. It hasn't been drawn yet, it hasn't been created yet. So you have to really be able with your like mind's eye, with your third eye, or whatever, to, to go to this this place that's just on a script, okay? And then the other thing is you're stationary, you're in front of a mic. Mm. So all of the sort of like embodiment and body language that you would be able to communicate in front of a camera when you're doing it uh, with your full your full vessel, mm. you don't have that luxury. Right, so you right. have to kind of channel that in different ways. And so a lot, if anybody ever saw 
you know, most of us, most voiceover actors, including myself, filming us while we're doing it. I mean, we look insane. We're flapping about. We're, <laughs> we're running. I'm sweating right. profusely. It's a real workout. Mm. Um, I will say voiceover work usually tires me the most. Really? It's the most, like, full, full-bodied performance because you, it's contained and it's taking the mental acuity and the, and the vocal acuity. You know, it's taking all of those elements, putting it together. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Wow, that, that's that's fascinating to me because again, I've always been very curious. Does that make sense, or I just it. no? It does. Right, yeah. It does make a lot of sense. I mean, not coming from that background, yeah. You know, it's uh, a, it's hard to kind of visualize it. But I have seen video of people doing voiceover and the wild well. Not, now a lot of days, um, and stuff. like back in the day when I did stuff like Tiny Tunes mm. and uh, well, I don't know, Animaniacs and. Some oh, of I love yeah, I did a lot of Hanna Barbera stuff before, cool. before they became Cartoon Network and all that stuff. Um, uh oh. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> um, I think that. No, I totally lost my train of thought. No, no, we, no, no. We're gonna blame Beatrice no, for okay. that, but. <laughs> uh oh. Right. That, like. I don't know. I totally lost my train of thought. That's okay. <laughs> right. We got it. No worries. You're we dead got meat it. To me, man. We got it. Look at that. You ruined my interview. <laughs> <laughs> Look, these are fun. You know, it's all good. So, we'll talk about nightmare. Yeah. Right. And uh, I, I always like to ask this question about you know people who are in the more iconic. Films. Does yeah. it surprise you still that after all this time, the horror fans still come out to to meet you, you guys, and take photos and get your autograph? Especially these movies came out, you know, decades ago. Yeah, it's incredible. And you know what's so great is that because it's such a specific genre, there there's always a story. You know, mm. horror films aren't watching horrors. Horror film. Horror film fans aren't just watching horror films because they like scary shit or gore. There's usually like a bit of like nostalgia that goes with it mm. or some sort of um, memory from their childhood where like, oh, I used to watch these with my, my dad, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And I think that that's always really interesting because it could seem so specific and like, why do you like to watch things that scare you. There's a lot of reasons we like to do that. It's kind of to fortify that our real lives aren't as terrible, right? right it's the right. same reason we watch like really bad reality TV, <laughs> right, right? right? Is we go like, oh, fuck. Taxes felt very rough this year, but I could watch this train wrecks life <laughs> and it makes my life feel right. not so bad. That's why we do it. I love it. Yeah. I love that's it. That's the psychology of it, I think. Well, it's interesting you bring that up because that's the, the I got into horror because I had a favorite aunt who would let me watch stuff that in a billion years my mother would never let me watch. There you go. And that's how I, I bonded with her over there that. You go. And that's how I developed a lifelong love now, of horror. Let me ask you a question. Yeah. Do you have that same thing with somebody in your life? I do. Yeah. My own daughter. There you go. So she just turned 17. Yeah. But ever since she was like 12 or 13, she started watching all the, like the 80s horror movies that I love and now we get together now she lives far away now so we don't see each other as much as I would like sure. but when we do guaranteed we watch a few horror movies together so Beautiful. that's it that's how see we that, pa that pattern yeah I love it I love absolutely. it absolutely yeah, cool. absolutely so I, I like that I don't often get asked questions so that's cool oh, right? Yeah, yeah. all right we'll switch um, so what are you up to these days what are you anything new you're working on any new projects coming up yeah my life is a little uh, it's different um, um, I kind of did two full tour of duties, I would say, in Los Angeles. One as a, as a kid and then one in my like mid-20s to mid-30s, another like decade, where I did things like uh, Glee and Raising Hope and Clone Wars and a lot of that animation stuff started then, Cartoon Network stuff. And then I was in the Upright Citizens Brigade for about seven years. Oh, cool. Did a bunch of improv and sketch with that 
theater. Started my own film company. Got kind of disenchanted. We did a bunch of shorts and a feature, and it was really fun to create stuff by myself, right? Right. I was doing some commercials, too, and they would always say, uh, yeah, you need to go in there to play this horse jockey. And I'd be like, I know I'm short, but I'm not a fucking horse jockey. And I'd go in there, and there'd be a slew of these these little guys. Mm -hmm. And they would look at me with disdain, like, you normie, get out of here. Oh, wow. And I was on their turf. And I remember I called my agent, and I was like, hey, I don't want to go out for anything where I'm, like, not... I don't want to go out for anything that's a physical thing. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah. Well, they were like, forget you. We'll get the next guy that doesn't mind pouring out his height. So, bye. Mm. And so I started figuring out the next left turn. And what that ended up being was I ended up going to London and getting my master's in theater directing. Mm. Uh, And I lived in London for about three years, uh, three and a half years. And I created a theater company called uh, Riot Act. Okay, And Uh, we did 12 shows in London whilst I was in school. I directed them. I adapted a bunch of Shakespeare and Chekhov really radical new versions of classic plays because I felt like these stories really matter. You know, the, the story of Hamlet is about just a child that misses their parent. Sure, right. That's a, that's a universal tale. But because it's all rough collars and elevated and kind of elitism, a lot of people in America don't like theater. Mm. But if you make it accessible, if you make it punk rock, if you make it full of electricity, then you got something. And so now the company exists in, in LA, and here, after uh, the pandemic, we just closed our first production. My first play I've directed in three years. It was very emotional. It felt amazing to be in a you know 50-seat black box. And at the end of the production, it was emotional. Yeah. And uh, my cast invited me on stage, because I don't normally do that after bows and they were like and I looked at the audience and all I said was you made it we all got out of our comas (laughs) and our isolation we hung tight and you made it and now it was the collective it was the connection which is exactly what these cons are about Mm. con for me is not just convention it's it's connection Right? I love it. And that's what it should... Exactly. That, that, that sounds exactly. like a wanky, like, Tony Roberts thing I just yeah, said. No, no, no. I love it. <laughs> it's, kind, it's kind of right. It, it absolutely know. is, and it is... I, You know, I, I am a consultant, I, so I work from home, you okay. know, so I'm home all the time. So it is great to be back out amongst people. Yeah. Again, you know, hanging out. Just having fun. Talking about stuff that we love. Totally. You know, it's great. <laughs> totally. So, yeah. So that's cool. that's kind of really all that I'm doing. I still uh, I make guacamole and kombucha in my past past <laughs> times. And um, nice. You know, I'm I'm writing all the time. I'm I'm mainly these days a playwright and a, and a director. I'll act once in a while when they when they want the freaky eyeballs. I'll I'll come out of retirement. I'll keep that in mind. Like they, they, we make indie films, so you I never know. It. Like <laughs> they, they, there was a there was a hot rumor for a while on Twitter that said, uh, and I never engaged in this stuff before, that was like, hey, is Chris Pratt's character from uh, the new Jurassic World uh, series, is that Whit Hertford's character 20 years later? And I hopped on that so fast, and I was like, hell no. That shit is mine, I'm not retired, and in no parallel universe does this face turn into a blonde matinee idol? <laughs> Never. <laughs> Never. <laughs> uh, I love it. <laughs> Wit, thank you so thank much you, for man. a few minutes Cheers. of your yeah, yeah. time. This was a lot of fun. Yeah, it was fun. Very enlightening. And I love the positive message. Oh, thanks, That's pal. very cool. Yeah, thank you. Wit Hartford, everybody here at New Jersey Horicon and Film Festival at the Showboat in Atlantic City, New Jersey. This is Todd Stewart-Shaharnard signing off. We will see all of you in the next interview.